Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue. Um, as you know, we are busy with convection heat transfer. There are quite a few chapters that covers it, and we already looked at chapter six, the fundamentals of convection. We've also looked at chapter seven, external forced convection, and now we are busy with chapter eight, which is internal forced convection. It's the most important chapter, and the next one would be on natural convection. In terms of the chapter that we are busy with, we've spent a lot of time on two very special cases. And those two cases were the cases of the constant wall temperature and the constant heat flux. And we've also investigated how the heat transfer coefficient or the Nusselt number develops. We have this uh, starting or first part in which the flow develops and after that obviously uh, and the flow only not only develops uh, thermally but also hydrodynamically with the velocity gradients and we have to be very very sure what is happening before we start using equations but at the end things came out actually very easy for the very very special case of fully developed flow. If it's, if it's a constant wall temperature condition, then the Nusselt number would be 3.67. If it's a constant heat flux, it would be 4.3. However, very important, it is only if the flow is fully developed. The previous lecture, we've started with an example, and that was an example of um, icy water. Let me just get my... Uh, yeah, this was an example of a pipe running underneath an icy lake. And the length of the pipe is 200 meters, and the diameter 300 millimeters. If the temperature was 20, it was given to us that oil is being pumped through it at a velocity of 2 meters per second. And they asked us to determine the outlet temperature and also the heat transfer rate. Now, one of the things that is always very difficult for students is this thing of that if this temperature is not known, what bulk temperature do I use? Because I have to go and get the properties at the bulk temperature. So just to be sort of silly and unrealistic, with the previous time, I've chosen the outlet temperature to be minus 20. Okay. Obviously, that would not be sensible. The icy lake it is specified in the problem that it ensures that the wall temperature <coughs> that the wall temperature remains at zero degrees Celsius. So the outlet temperature can't be lower than zero. Okay, you agree? Okay, but I've chosen it minus 20, and the result would then be that I choose the bulk temperature as zero, which is the average between minus 20 and 20. In many cases, what people will also do is they will choose the bulk temperature of that temperature. Okay. And I'm going to show you now how sensitive it is and how you handle this. So we guess it, and because of that, we've, the bulk temperature is now zero degrees Celsius, and then we can go to table A13 in which we can get the properties of oil. And the properties of oil, there's the density, the CP and the prandtl. There are some more properties. I didn't write it down. It is all in the previous lecture. Okay, so I'm just summarizing everything because with the previous lecture, I just needed two, three more minutes to finish this problem and I couldn't do it. Okay. Right, so then we calculated the Reynolds number. The velocity is given as 0.2 meters per second. We've got the diameter the viscosity, laminar flow, Reynolds number is 141. Let's calculate how long it will take before it thermally fully develops. It would be 98 meters. Okay. Now 98 meters on 200 meters is almost half of the tube. Okay. We didn't calculate the LH. Okay. Because the LH is that same equation without the Prandtl number. The Prandtl number is larger than one, so we know that LH would be smaller. 
Okay, so if the prandtl is larger than one, <laughs> then that one will always be the one that determines how long it will take before the flow is fully developed. So, now because of this, we cannot make the assumption that the flow is fully developed and we can use a nusselt number of 3.66. Okay. We have to take into consideration this region in which the nusselt number will be higher. And there is an, an equation for that. And the equation looks like this, nusselt number 3.66 plus quite a number of terms. I didn't write it, all of them in here. There's not in your textbook a similar equation for the constant heat flux condition because that equation is much more complex and it is one that you have to solve numerically. Okay, so when we put it in, we can calculate the Nusselt number, 4.2, it should be higher than 3.66. Now that we've got the Nusselt number, everything is known, we can calculate the heat transfer coefficient can calculate the surface area as well as the cross-sectional area. We've calculated the mass flow rate. Why? Because we want to calculate the NTUs. The NTUs is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area divided by the mass flow rate and the CP. And, Tanya, we can see the Nusselt number of the of NTUs is very, very low. What does it mean? It means that this thing is not going to really be a good heat exchanger. It is not really designed as a heat exchanger, but the NTUs tells us that the heat transfer process is not going to be very effective. We know that if the NTUs is about 3, then it would be very effective, and anything more than about 3, three you'll in any case start uh, wasting, wasting your money. Okay, that is not good. So this is already a red flag for us that this is actually not a good problem or something strange is going to happen here. Okay, now we can calculate the outlet temperature with that equation that we've derived. Surface temperature, the initial temperature, e to the minus NTUs. Take note, I've discussed it previously with you, I prefer that you do not use that in that equation. Okay, because then you do not have a physical feeling for the NTUs. Okay. Right, and now we see that the outlet temperature is 19.97. Okay, so we've started with 20. After 200 meters, a wall temperature of zero, the temperature almost didn't change. The NTUs is telling us that. Okay, so the outlet temperature is 19. So that was the inlet temperature, that is the outlet temperature. That's the wall temperature, that is the wall temperature. Now we can calculate the LMTD. The LMTD is this temperature difference, is 20, minus that temperature difference divided by the limb of that term divided by that term. Okay. And fortunately, I mean you can just look at it, it should almost be 20. It is 19.98. Now we can calculate the heat transfer rate as the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area multiplied by LMTD, and it gives us a heat transfer rate of 7.8 kilowatts. And I think that is about where the lecture ends. Now, let's look at, at our outlet temperature and the one that I assumed. So it is a big difference, isn't it? So what do we do now? We choose or let's say correct the bulk temperature. And the bulk temperature should be now 20 plus 19.97 divided by 2. So for all practical purposes, the bulk temperature is now about 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, 19.98. Okay. And then at 19.98, we can go and reselect all the other properties and typically uh, mm, the density is 88.1. 8, 8 I'm not going to write down the units now just to save time. The K is equal to 0 0.145. 
kinematic viscosity is equal to 9.429 multiplied by 10 to the minus 4. I'm not even going to write down the CP value. You can go and look that yourself. And the Prandtl number is equal to 10.863. Okay. Now, we've got different properties. And now we just have to redo all the calculations. Okay. So if we go and redo it, I'm just going to write down some of the most important ones. Then the length, how long it is going to take, is now going to be 103.7 meters. The Nusselt number, if we recalculate it, be 4.227. The heat transfer coefficient is going to change to 2.043. Outlet temperature, okay. outlet temperature is going to change to 19.97. Okay, so it's really not that sensitive in many cases, not always, <laughs> in many cases. Okay. And if we now recalculate the heat transfer rate, then it would be 7.7 .7 kilowatts. Okay, are you happy with this problem? I was so hoping that one of you will see a mistake in it. <coughs> From the beginning. Yes? Your exit temperature, your exit temperature can never be below zero. Not oh, sure. Uh, but uh, I could have obviously, yes, uh, selected another temperature. But I've just done this problem to be silly and to look at the extreme, and yes, to choose minus 20 so that I can have a bulk temperature of zero. Plus 20 and minus 20, a bulk temperature unrealistic of zero. I think most of us would have said, well, let's choose 20 plus zero, the wall temperature, let's choose 10. Okay, and that is fine. You can use 10, get all the properties, do the problem, okay, get the outlet temperature, which isn't minus 20, it is unrealistic, and then get the new bulk temperature and redo all the calculations. Okay. The trap was the Prandtl number. The Prandtl number, please go and look in your table A13, those of you who do have it. Table A13, it is a classical mistake that many of us have made. Okay. Okay. What is that classical mistake? Table A13, go and look in oil. Look at the properties of oil for me. The properties of oil is not approximately 10.863. It is equal to 10,863. Okay, that comma is the thousand in many textbooks. So be very careful for that. Okay. Okay. Now, it should make a big difference, isn't it? I mean, a significant difference. Okay. okay. Now, if you go and do, redo it with the correct Prandtl number, either this one here or with this one, because this one should have been 46,000. Okay, not 10,000, 46,000. Okay, all right. If you go and redo the problem, then you're going to found that LT is 104 kilometers. 104 kilometers before the boundary layer will be fully developed. Okay, very, very long. Why? The Prandtl number, that is so high. So typically in oils, and some of you are going to work in the air conditioning and refrigeration industry where you work with glycols. Glycol also have a high Prandtl number, then you can have similar types of behaviors. 
Okay, so LT changes to that. Then the Nusselt number is going to be significantly higher, 37.32. The heat transfer coefficient is going to be 18.04. The outlet temperature, you wouldn't believe it, is going to be 19.97. <laughs> okay. Again, what is the reason? Go and check the NTUs. The NTUs is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area, the mass flow rate, and the CP. And it is going to increase... It's going to be an increase. Look, previously it was 0.001. Now it changes to 0.014. So there's an order of magnitude increase. But still, it is very, very low. And that is the reason why the change in temperature is so low. Okay. And then you can go and calculate the... Uh, the heat transfer rate, now the heat transfer rate, what do you think will happen with the heat transfer rate? <laughs> the heat transfer rate, remember, is a function of the heat transfer coefficient. The LMTD is going to be about the same, isn't it? It's not going to change that much, but the heat transfer coefficient. Previously the heat transfer coefficient was about 2, now it is 18. So the heat transfer rate would be about 10 times higher. So it would be 67.5 kilowatts, if you go and calculate it. Okay. That is the work on laminar flow. Remember that the Nusselt number is a function of x. It is an engineering judgment in terms of when you can use the equations for fully developed. If we have a case where we have a constant heat flux, okay, and the Nusselt number is equal to 4.3, and it takes a very, very small distance before it is fully developed, then it is very easy to say, well, in this problem, I'm going to assume an assault number of 4.3. Okay. If this moves to that, then it complicates things, and you have to take that into consideration. Okay. Right, let's move to the next part, paragraph 8.6 in the textbook of Sengel and Gajar, which is on turbulent flow. Okay, turbulent flow. Uh, let me, I uh, actually would like to take this out. Okay, so it's turbulent flow, internal, and we're going to start with the simplest geometry, which, which is a tube. Okay, so what happens in tubes? in terms of friction factor and Nusselt number. Friction factor is a function of Reynolds number and Nusselt number as a function of Reynolds number. Okay. Four typically flow through a tube. Okay. We know that we have a region of laminar flow and then turbulent flow. And there's this region in between where things are a little bit unknown, unpredictable. It depends on the type of inlet and also on upstream conditions. Okay. Now this is about at 2,300. Okay. Then we also have a special value there of 10,000, and I'm going to explain that just now. Okay. Right, 
So, in terms of the friction factor, the friction factor is the easiest one in terms of it's a straight line, straight line, and the friction factor is equal to 64 divided by the Reynolds number. We've done it in fluid mechanics and we've done it many times. And you can see it on the Moody chart. So the friction factor in laminar flow, it's a straight line. Remember, this is a logarithmic scale. That is why it is a straight line. But it is equal to 64 divided by the Reynolds number. Then we have the transition flow regime. And typically, the flow would do something like that. If you do very good measurements, like we did in our lab, then you can actually go and quantify all those points very, very nicely. And then after that, we have something like that. And that would be for epsilon divided by d equal to zero. What is epsilon? Epsilon is the little bit of obstructions or disturbances in the pipe in terms of the, or sort of the roughness, the roughness. So this is a smooth tube. For a smooth tube. Okay. Okay. Now for a rough tube, things would start doing something like that. And epsilon divided by d will increase in that direction. Now, 10,000 is, uh, as I've said, a special type of Reynolds number because all experiments show that if the Reynolds number is larger than 10,000, then the flow will always stay turbulent. Okay. Between 2,300 and 10,000, or between 3,000 and 10,000, things are a little bit more unpredictable, and it is called the lower Reynolds number end, and it is a special um, subject or speciality of fluid mechanics and heat transfer, and we do not have the time to go into that detail. Okay. Right, so that is typically how it looks like, and typical equations that we can use for specifically smooth tubes. So if it is smooth, then we can use, for example, the Petikoff equation, Petikoff equation of 1970, and that equation says that the friction factor is equal to um, 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 um. now I didn't write it down, but uh, the other equation, sorry, is equal to 0 0.184 multiplied by Reynolds to the minus 0 0.2. I'm going to show you the Petikoff equation just now. Okay, so there is a Petikoff equation that we can use for the friction factor for a smooth tube. And then we have this equation, which is called the power law equation. And there are many more equations that you can use. Some easier than others, some more accurate than others, and some that you cannot solve explicitly, but you have to iterate to get them. You've done that in fluid mechanics. Right. In terms of the heat transfer, in terms of the heat transfer, and now we have to be very careful, those special cases where the flow is fully developed, okay, a constant wall temperature, then it would be 3.66, okay, and if it's a constant heat flux, a constant heat flux, then the Nusselt number would be equal to 4.3, okay. Okay, so... And that is actually very difficult to get, practically and in a lab. It almost never happens. As like with the previous problem, we always have a first part of developing flow, and then in the next chapter we are going to do secondary flow. So based or induced on the forced convection will also be secondary flow. Secondary flow would be, if you look at the tube like this, okay, then maybe you're heating it, then this temperature will be higher than that temperature. And the result would be that the density would be lower here than there, and the result would be a secondary flow in the tube 
that looks typically like that. Okay, induced on it. Okay. And that, that would actually, the result of that would be what we call mixed convection and it would actually increase those values. But, okay, so that is typically how it looks like. And then in the transition flow regime, depending on the type of inlet that you use, you can get a type of transition like that. But once the flow is turbulent, then typically we will have something like that. Okay. And in the turbulent flow regime, the missile number is a function of well, now it depends on who did the research and who did the measurements. All of them are functions of Reynolds number and Prondel. Okay. But because it wasn't that accurate, the surface roughness was also started, starting to be taken into consideration. And then later on, there were also problems where there were huge differences in the viscosities from the, from the surface to the center. Okay. And the result would then be also viscosities like that. Okay. Okay, and there on the, okay, so because it's going to take too much time, uh, I cannot write down all these equations for you, but in the textbook typically, you can see there is the Petikoff equation, the one that I've referred to there of 1970. Take note, it's for a smooth tube, and it has limitations in terms of the Reynolds number, 3,000 to 5 million. Okay. Then, the first equation that has been developed is equation 866 in your textbook, and that equation is called the chilton colburn analogy. Okay. And as you can see, it is quite a simple equation to use. But we see the friction factor there, and we need to use the friction factor from there, or you need to get it from experiments or from the Moody chart. Okay, and then people started developing more accurate uh, equations, and the next one is equation 867, and that was the equations of, um, let me see, I think it was also Chilton and Colbin that did some follow-up work, and then they developed those equations. Nusselt number is equal to 0 0.023, Reynolds to the 0 0.8, Prandtl to the third. Prandtl number range and the Reynolds number range. Take note, the Reynolds number range is larger than 10,000. Okay. Now, this is a very easy and a simple equation, as well as the next one, which is called the Dittes and Boulter equation, which was developed a few years later. And the Dittes and Boulter equation says the Nusselt number is equal to 0 0.023, multiplied by the Reynolds to the 0 0.8, Prandtl to the N, where N is equal to 0 0.3 if you do heating, on the tube or the fluid, and 0.4 if you do cooling. Okay. Okay. And then more equations starting to develop. And as you can see, they start becoming more complicated and more terms are being added. For example, here we can see the viscosity ratio. So this is specifically for the cases, as I've mentioned, where you can have huge differences in viscosities. Glycol, for example, is sp specifically in the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning industry. In this case, that ratio would be significant. And also the oil example that we've done, if the pipe was much, much longer, then that would be very, very important. And then after that, as you can see, the equation starts becoming more and more complicated. And the last one is called the Petikoff and Glinsky equation. Okay, Petikoff and Glinsky and Glinsky. As you can see, it has in it the friction factor, the Reynolds number, and the Prandtl number. Now this work was done more than 60 years ago, and at that stage, the engineering science of uncertainty analysis wasn't developed. 
So the equations were developed. Obviously, they didn't have the good measurements or the instrumentation that we have today. And if you take all these equations and you choose a, Reyn a Reynolds number, maybe of 3,000 or 10,000, and you choose a Pronal number of 10, and you would go and calculate the Nusselt numbers of all these equations, it's going to be all over the page. Okay. Huge, huge differences. The textbook mentioned plus or minus 25. My experience is plus or minus 40%. Okay. And in the textbook, the authors say that the Petikoff and Glinsky equation is plus or minus 10%. Uh, I've never seen it. It hasn't been done. Uh, with time, uh, people started assuming that this last equation is the most accurate one. And it, it is indeed the most accurate one. But still, up to today, we do not know how accurate they really are. Okay. Now, fortunately, in our lab, we did some work. <laughs> and I had two very good students. Okay. The first one is Nicole Bateman. Okay. Nicole Bateman, and she's been working on this now for the past few years. And she's writing up her dissertation. And the equation that we have developed that we hope to publish very soon looks like this. The Nusselt number is equal to pi divided by 70 multiplied by the friction factor, Reynolds to the 1.11, and Prandtl to the third. Okay, and we are definitely sure the uncertainty of that equation is much less than 10%. Okay, then another student of mine, Mother Stein, has developed another one, and he's also writing up his dissertation, and his equation looks something like this. Nusselt number is equal to 0.0127 multiplied by Reynolds to the 0.84, Prandtl to the 0.42, and the viscosity ratio to the power of 0.13, and an accuracy of less than 5% an error less than 5%. Okay, so just take note of this. You don't have to use it. You can use the equations in the textbook to keep things simple. And again, your selection of the equation is going to be the one of the biggest issues for you. So you will have to go and read the fine print. You will have to go and look at the Reynolds number ranges. Normally, this last one would be the most accurate, that one there. Okay. But it means you will have to go and calculate the friction factor. It's a little bit of a longer equation. It's easier to make an error. If I'm in the lab or if I have to do a problem in industry and I just quickly want to have a feeling for the initial number, then that is the one I use. 0.023, Reynolds to the 0.8, Prandtl to the third, very, very simple equation. You can do the calculations very, very easy, very, very quickly. Okay. So there's a large number of selections that you can choose from. Now there's also other fluids which are very special, like liquid metals, mercury, for example. Many of these are being used in the nuclear industry. And their ranges are quite different in terms of Prandtl numbers, and equations have been developed for them also. Equations 873 and 872 in your textbook. You can see for the one, constant wall temperature, and the, for the other one, a constant heat flux. Okay, and then there's also an equation for rough tubes. Okay, equation 875 in your textbook if you need to get the friction factor for rough tubes. Okay. Okay. Something else that is also very important to us is flow in annily. Okay. Flow in an annulus. Okay. If we look typically at a tube, okay, tube, then the simplest type of heat exchanger is one tube inside another, typically like that.
Okay. Where the flow in the inner tube maybe goes in this direction, and the flow in the annulus would go in that direction. Okay. So, if we look at it from this side, then we will have that diameter there, which we call the inner diameter. Okay. And that would be the outer diameter of the inner tube. Okay. And then for the outer tube, we will use that diameter there. That's the outer one. And the reason is very simple. All the flow happens in between there. Okay, that's flow in an annulus. So when we get problems like that, then the simplest approach that was used for years and years, and which is also sort of used in your textbook with a little bit of a modification, is to say, well, let's calculate for an annulus the hydraulic diameter. Because the equations that I've mentioned are all valid for a tube, a circular tube, not another geometry. Okay. If we have something like this now, we can calculate the hydraulic diameter, which is equal to four times the cross-sectional area divided by the perimeter. We've done it previously, I'm not going to do it now, but then you can derive that it is equal to the change in diameter. The difference in diameter would be the hydraulic diameter. And what we then do is we would calculate the Nusselt number in the annulus, Nusselt number zero, okay, would then mean it is the Nusselt number there, so zero, okay. okay. There is Nusselt zero in the annulus, and then there will be another Nusselt number which would be in the inner tube, and for that we use I to indicate the inner tube, and that one is for the annulus. Okay, so if we then have the hydraulic diameter, we can use the hydraulic diameter in all the other equations to get an estimate of the Nusselt number. And the result would then be the heat transfer coefficient in the annulus multiplied by the hydraulic diameter divided by K. Now in your textbook there's also a table 8.4. I'll show it to you quickly. And that was developed by Keyes and Perkins in 1972. And it would give to you for different ratios of the annulus ratio missile numbers. Okay? Okay. Now that was in 1972, it wasn't very accurate. Now Dr. Jaku Durker, he was a student of mine, an undergraduate student. Okay. And I recruited him to do his final year project with me, and then his master's and his PhD. And since then, the two of us, and with other students, have been working on developing equations for getting the Nusselt number in the annulus. So the first publication on this was in 2007, and since then, there has been quite a number of them. And the most recent one was last year by a student of us, Warren van Seil, who did his master's. And he produced these two fantastic graphs. That is typically now for an annulus, which is being cooled. And there you can see the results. And this is just some of his results for a very specific ratio a is the diameter ratio, okay, and there you can see the results, and we've also compared it to the work of others, and it is very, very accurate. And then similar results for uh, annulus, which is being heated, okay. So at this stage, you just need to know that a lot of work has been done for getting the Nusselt numbers in an annulus, okay, and um, our work is by far uh, the, mo the most work uh, that we did, and it's also the most state-of-the-art. 
So you can go and look at it when you need it. But for the test and the exam, you can use the table. That is fine. Okay. Right. Any questions on flow in Anili? Okay. Now another part, another thing that is very important in turbulent flow is heat transfer enhancement. Okay, heat transfer enhancement. So the tubes, all the tubes that we've considered here are smooth tubes. Okay. Smooth tubes. The next one was an annulus. And now, over the past 30, 40 years, a lot of work has been done on what we call enhanced heat transfer. How can we get better heat transfer? How can we use less material? How can we make heat exchanges more effective? And the study of enhanced heat transfer, okay, enhanced heat transfer, okay. the person who did most of this work is Professor Art Burgels. Art Burgels, he passed away about a month ago. Okay. So you can go and look at his work. And in his work, you will see how they have started with on the inner tube, putting in fins, typically, okay. all different geometries or fins like that, the first generations. And then it wasn't long before they've started twisting it sort of on the inside and spiraling it. And here's an example of typically a copper tube, how you can see on the inside typically about 80 fins, which is being used, the fin height of only about 0.3 to 0.4 millimeters, and it is spiraled at about 18 degrees. It really enhances the heat transfer by a factor of two or three. Okay. Then, uh, unfortunately, this is not a very um, uh, clear uh, slide. Uh, another type of heat exchanger which is very effective, specifically a tube one, is if you just take a smooth tube and you twist it. Okay. And if you're going to twist it in the lab or the workshop, it is not going to work. You have to develop special ways in terms of how you can do it. But when you twist it, then on the outside and on the inside, the geometry really changes a lot. And you get typically something like that. Okay. Call it a fluted tube heat exchanger. And there are thousands of methods that has been developed for enhancing heat transfer. There you can see some more examples. And unfortunately, I see this is not very clear. And then you can also put in wires or twisted tapes. Just take a, a copper or a stainless steel thin plate and just twist it and then put it on the inside of the tube, especially used for fluids with high prandtl numbers. And then even wires on the inside. Okay, so lots and lots of methods that has been used and in our laboratory we have also published a lot of work on it and you can just go and look what is available. Everyone has its advantages and disadvantages. There's not one of them that you can always say that is the best one. Okay, just give me one more second. Okay, just one more second. Okay, now in terms of enhanced heat transfer, there are two strategies that can be followed two strategies. The one is to give more surface and to do things like that. But in principle, the heat transfer coefficient is directly proportional to K and the thermal boundary layer thickness. So all these methods have the advantage that it breaks the boundary layer all the time and it has to start developing again. Okay. And not only that, but also just the additional surface area. The other method that can be used is to look at increasing the thermal conductivity. Okay. So if you think of water, for example, the K for water is about 0.6 watts per meter Kelvin. Watts per meter Kelvin. Okay. Well, K for carbon is about 3,000 about 3,000. So it's about 50,000 times higher. So there's a large, a lot of people doing work in this regard where we look at nano carbon nanotubes. Okay. So on nano size, 
a few nanometers, and inside that tube there are actually quite a few layers of them. And one of my students, Kirsten Grote and I, recently looked at carbon nanotubes, and we've published some work in that regard, and that is another method that can be used increasing the K just by a small concentration of carbon nanotubes, less than 1%, and you can actually double or two times or three times increase the heat transfer coefficient. Right, thank you ladies and gentlemen. <coughs>